Welcome to the Off the Road Again podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Ross. And I'm Jason. <laughs> uh, this is our podcast about anything and everything off road. Um, we're still socially distanced. We did it. It's the only way we can do the show is we have to be. Uh, I'm still in the Midwest, Ross in the Northeast, and Jason's in West Virginia. So I'm the only one not in the correct time zone tonight. <laughs> this is a, a <laughs> flip flopping of time zones, percentages for each at least. Yeah. Yeah, normally our guests are from the West Coast. <laughs> Probably 75%. Well, thanks for inviting us East Coasters here. Yeah. Uh, we, I think it's you and uh, Chris at U Joint Off Road. Um, yep. And then Kevin and Bowman. Yeah. I guess they are far enough east that they're Eastern time zone. Ten, it's like half of Tennessee. Tennessee. Is. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. We'll um, get to plugged up with some more East Coasters here. Yes, please. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Those are our people. When when Everybody we started a, on the show, yeah. When we started a podcast, <laughs> it was just the two of us talking back and forth. And after like five episodes, we were like, we probably need to find someone else to talk to. <laughs> and then when I had no idea the amount of work it takes to try to schedule guests. <laughs> yeah, oh, and yeah. the funny thing, most of probably our most recurring guest is somebody who's like, not just figuratively but literally on the other side of the world <laughs> yeah jolson oh, yeah. australia he's been on, australia he's yeah. been on three or four times now uh emmy hall's been on three times emmy's been on a bunch yeah and lynn's been on twice but hint hint wink wink people. nudge nudge lynn's coming back yeah. um yeah that's all the recurring right now so uh so bronco or not bronco good lord that's <laughs> So for the life of this podcast, uh, Jason, all we've done is talk about Ford Bronco because literally... Not all. No, that's unfair to everything else. (laughs) It's not surprising. Did you dedicate a whole episode to the Bronco sport? We did. Uh, Uh, Oh, did you really? (laughs) We dedicated time to it because Zach Bowman and Kevin Ray at UTV Driver spent a long time using it as like a tow rig with a a side-by-side. Like they actually had real world knowledge of it. So... There's a solid five minutes in an episode about the Broncos yeah. sport. Not the most favorable in terms of towing, but. Hey, it's the Bronco too of the 21st century. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So, so yeah. What, what came out today though, and we, we were recording and this, I, I'm sharing my screen for Ross only, <laughs> uh, but Bronco drive happened today. No, oh, God, he did it again. Raptor. Raptor. Still Raptor. <laughs> oh, it's on your mind. I don't even want a Bronco. Like (laughs) (laughs) Raptor Drive. Raptor drives were today and yesterday. And so I will I will give props. Like the the marketer in me understands like I I've I've enjoyed the way Ford does their marketing because I feel like it's well thought out. They took all these car journalists out to the Nevada desert and made them get up pre-sunrise to go drive these things out into the desert. And so there's tons of photos and videos that came out today of the sun coming up and a line of Broncos with lights on and flags on the back so they could go play in the desert. Um, yeah, it, it looks great. It looks great. <laughs> it looks like a Raptor. I think you said Bronco again. Did I say Bronco again? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, if I ever, uh, if I ever get a hold of your computer, I'm going to do the thing on where you like you change the autocorrect yeah. so every time you, i type every raptor, time it changes you, the bronco yeah <laughs> it's like a like a proper rick roll for a bronco yes. exactly Gosh. so yeah i mean so these are embargoed until the 31st is what i'm reading but I for, mean, for yeah actual driving impressions actual like, driving impressions but we heard videos of the exhausts and the, the biggest problem for most people with the second generation bronco was that the twin turret the eco boost v6 just sounded terrible like it, it it made a gtr sound good which is really saying a lot so supposedly they fixed that uh there were a few videos circulating today and other than that i mean did you guys see where the coils are mounted on these things like off the rear axle they're like perched on the backside, almost like behind the tire it's what really strange and there's a lot of questions but i don't know if people were jumping these things all day today it looks like they held up all right build it to send it 
if you're going to drop 70 G's on a, on a Ford pickup truck, that's made to do it. It better do it. So it better do it. Yeah. So that's uh that's Raptor news. Uh, if we want to talk Bronco news today, it came out that the Bronco pickup is supposedly dead, which would have just been stepping on their own toes if they decided to build it anyways. So well, it's a good thing they decided mm-hmm. not to. Um, I know honest. you have something to say. <laughs> well, uh, like they'll restart it in two years, just so it's something else of we course. can talk about. Like they, yeah, they're really good about giving us something to talk about. That's what Ford does. Uh, GMC mm-hmm. gave us something to talk about, though. That beautiful 6.2 is going to be available in almost all of the Yukons next year, which means that the kind of off roady, want to be off roader, somewhat decent at off roading AT4 is going to have the 6.2 if you want it which is fantastic because that engine is absolutely glorious. Even, you know, 20 years after it uh, kind of made its debut on the architecture scale in the, the five, three. <laughs> so I hey, don't, I don't, don't knock my five, three, the five, three is a great engine. I will never say anything bad about that. <laughs> I've had it in two vehicles. I don't want the one in the garage to hear you slandering it. <laughs> hey, the avalanche that I had, which was owned by my dad and then me and then my brother. And now one of my best friends has like 210 on it still runs perfect. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I think we had a, a talk about the avalanche um, on our trip that we just got back from, we were driving down the road. Of course you're in your truck all day, like looking at your dash and running cameras and stuff. Like you got to have something to talk about. We talked about everything, but we spent a solid hour talking about the avalanche and, you know, all the changes they made and went through and, truck. you know, and, and still how many of them that you see out today still driving. Yeah. There's um, not really anything that replaces what the like modularity of that vehicle did, you know, with the mid gate, <laughs> you, there's nothing you can get that smaller and has a, what's technically an eight foot bed. Yeah. Not an eight foot bed. I'm thinking like a, uh, maybe a Honda Ridgeline, like the baby, like the baby brother or baby sister yeah. to the, uh, to the avalanche, but there's a whole bunch that are trying to follow the avalanche now. Like, yeah, we had the Baja, you know, in the early two thousands, but now there's the, the Ridgeline still, still going strong. And the Ridgeline is great. I think and you misspoke. What avalanche followed the brat. Don't forget the brat. Oh yeah. But <laughs> that's yeah. Oh. The brat. Well, that's... then there was the El Camino. Exactly. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Slippery slope here. You, you also need to remember <laughs> that the avalanche is a truck that became an SUV that then became a truck. Yeah. Cause it went oh. from Silverado to Tahoe and then they threw the bed on the back of it again. To re... well, it was a suburban. <laughs> right. First gen so, suburban. Silverado. Silverado is the same chassis suburban. as the suburban. Death. So Silverado, Silverado to Suburban, springs, Suburban leaf to the springs, Avalanche. Coils, yeah. <laughs> I saw uh, that on Twitter today. Tam- Tamerlane crushed it, and it was like, everybody was like, yeah, this gave me something to think about. <laughs> I don't know. I think a new Avalanche today would kill, especially with that 6.2. But, you know, I'm not a problem. Yeah, I'm kind of interested to see how this uh, – I'm kind of interested to see how this, this Tundra on coils is going to perform – just, um, I mean, you'd like to think that Toyota's done their research on the new Tundra because it's been so long since there was a new Tundra, but, you know. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a nine, I just bought a 98 T100 with 50,000 miles on it. 50? And, um, that sounds amazing. 50. 50,000 miles, bought it for $4,300. And it's <laughs> like, I mean, it's the interior is like you just stepped onto the car a lot in 1998. Um, That's so bad. But, uh, <laughs> I bet it's I mean, all the a, same buttons a, that were in my Land Cruiser. It probably. <laughs> well, you know what's funny? It, what's really funny about it is the, um, the I drive a Tundra for a work vehicle and um, the mirror controls on the Tundra <laughs> is the same the same button T-100. cluster as the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, that was on the T100 <laughs> and, and, the, and, the, and the first gen Tacomas. It's very so, Toyota. Um, very. It is. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, but it's just such a 
fun truck to drive. I mean, the, the um, approach angle on it is just absurd. Like, it's just like you could almost just drive up to a wall and start climbing up it. And then, the, you know, the, you know, when they started making the new Tundras and they started making the Tacoma, Tacoma they started to drop in the, um, the quarter panel line behind mm-hmm. the rear tires. But on the yeah, P100, it's just, yeah, or something, you know, they just, they just brought that, they brought that rear quarter panel down as it kind of, you know, molded into the bumper. But on the T100, I mean, it sits, it sits probably every bit as, you know, two and a half to three feet off the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's still such a good looking, tr- like, I remember watching videos of those things off roading as a kid, you know, and I was like, where did this come from? <laughs> you know, because it was the yeah. only like contemporary, off-road capable four by fours that had a pickup bed were like i don't know nissan made that crazy hard body at one point and Mm -hmm. it was like zr2 s10 and other than that Mm -hmm. you couldn't off-road with a pickup is that is the t100 zr2 when that came out yeah that was something i like that truck does the t100 have a box frame or is it a c channel it's box it's, yeah, I think, well, you know what? I don't know. I've actually got images on my phone, but I'm talking on it right now. I guess I, since I've not got a video, I can probably look at it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what I did was I spent, I did spend some time underneath of it looking at it because I knew that, you know, some of those T100s, first gen, you know, obviously first gen Tacomas and the first gen Tundras were having all sorts of frame problems, but this thing mm-hmm. is just in great shape. And I think the, you know, um, I think the problem with the Tacomas and the Toyotas pickups, you know, those, you know, late nineties models is they just didn't leak enough oil to kind of preserve the frame. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so you've got all these like, own, really dry, you got all these really dry frames that weren't painted sufficiently or locked in and, you know, but uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a fun little go getter, man. And it's, it's, you know, I look forward to getting home and driving that, you know, and taking my kid to the river and stuff like that so it's, it's a lot of fun is it cool is it a four by four <clears throat> what kind of question is that i, I mean i to be honest <laughs> every time i see a t100 i feel like it's two-wheel drive so it's well true i mean i guess it is i mean it's just so it's you know we're so used to seeing four-wheel drives and you know coming across the two-wheel drive pickups a little bit it's just different where we're at um <laughs> yeah. but it definitely it is it, definitely uh four wheel drive in fact it's like you know when you own a minivan like you see minivans everywhere if you don't own a minivan you're never looking for them yep. but you know you own this t100 you see them everywhere and i've i've seen some of the first t100s that came out and <laughs> part of toyota's marketing scheme was like it's the first pickup bed that you can put a four by eight sheet of plywood in the back of it between the fender mm. wheels and so i saw a two wheel drive long bed t100 in roanoke virginia a few weeks ago i mean and i mean the thing looked just like a land rocket i mean and the, <laughs> and the bed the bed of it was just enormous um but uh no it's definitely four-wheel drive uh whatever six and a half foot bed um you know so it's uh it's a fun little pickup i'll have to send you guys a picture of one the next time i see one i swear it, it can't be more than one every six months up here because they all just rusted into the earth. Oh, yeah, I believe it. Once you get up into, you know, we talk a lot about suspension, you know, and outfitting trucks. And um, there's a lot of really good products out there for, you know, Tacomas and Colorados mm-hmm. and, you know, everything else. I don't want to exclude anybody. But, um, you know, the, the, the chromoly or the unanodized aluminum that you see a lot of in the, on the West Coast, like it, that stuff just does not work. You can get away with it down here, but you cannot get away with it in New England yep. at all. We, uh, before we started the show, I was doing research on what kind of rust proofing to do on the vehicle that I'm buying since it's coming from the <laughs> West Coast. God damn, I can't believe I have to do, like look at this shit. <laughs> you don't have to. You can just get rid of it in a couple of years. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> right. it's it'll probably rust like in the first five minutes here with the humidity, anyways. So I was like, oh my god, what is this place? Yeah. <laughs> what what engines in your T one hundred? Three four. Three four. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, There's... same engine that was in I, I my first. Well, you know, we were finally we were talking about the Bronco Sport. My first uh, 
my first vehicle in, in high school was a Bronco two. And <laughs> I mean, I loved that thing. I had put five transmissions in it. Um, it was a horrible, a horrible combination with that. It had the two, two, nine fuel injected engine. And I think that, I think that, um, I think it had a Taurus transmission in it. Maybe I can't, it could be wrong. I'm sure there's some Ford guys out there that could correct. Why me, did it kill five transmissions? Was, uh, well, I know I killed the first one, but every time we got it fixed or got it worked on again, um, you know, it just was, it never, it would never run the same because we would, we mm-hmm. have the transmission rebuilt. I don't know if it was the shop or, you know, what, but at that point in time, you couldn't do a lot of searching on the internet, you know, um, maybe, yeah. maybe on America Online or Netscape or something, but, <laughs> MSN, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or talk to somebody in a chat room. <laughs> um, but uh, no, so it was, it was, something. uh, yeah right. <laughs> um, it, it it was they were notorious for you know the automatics mm. specifically were notorious for transmission problems. Huh. Um, but I just loved the truck, even though it was the most top heavy vehicle that you could buy. <laughs> you know, I just I just loved it and uh, yeah had had thirty twos on it and um, nothing crazy, but it was just a, a I mean you could put a, a twin bed in the back of it, drop the seats, and you know it was a camping mobile. Well, those, Chris those, just had yeah those windows up the side. I love that. Like, exactly. like a Land Rover those Discovery. Windows, <laughs> those, those like yeah, yeah the exactly. back windows are wild. How much do you think it cost them to make those? And how hard do you think it is I, to get a replacement right now? Oh, to get a replacement? Yeah. I don't know. You you think your safe lights? I don't know. That's a good question. You know, I think you think it's they'd just, have that dialed in, but I I just remember people talking about. You know, oh, I, I don't ever break the back window. You know, it's so expensive. You know, whatever, but uh, never did. Fortunately, never did get too far in it before I had to put another transmission in it. But, um, so, but yeah. So, you know, beyond that, I, you know, I moved into like a three-quarter ton Chevy pickup, um, like that late '90s model three-quarter ton with the, you know, the, um, you know, the fender flares on it, and it was mm-hmm. a standard cab you know, V8 pickup. Um, and then I went into 2001 Tacoma and it had, so it had the same engine this Tundra has, um, yeah. and uh, very, very reliable platform. Um, but, uh, cool. Yeah. No, take that fold on those things. Mm-hmm. One of the few redeeming yeah. qualities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there, there is a supercharger yeah. available. Yeah, there is a supercharger available. Bucks. Yeah. You know, I got a $4,000 truck. I'm going to put a $6,500 right. supercharger on it. Do None of this is fiscally responsible. None of this and then like, kill you. There goes your transmission. <laughs> there goes your rear diff. There goes pretty much every U joint on the vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did a we did a pretty. Um, we didn't really need to do much because it was just a one owner owner truck, and the guy just drove it around town. But uh, we did a full a full service on all the fluids, um, and the guys in the shop were like, you know, they were just, just kind of like this truck only has 50,000 miles, but when they drop the engine oil out of it and, you know, the rear end oil and, and gear oil and stuff out of it, they were just shocked, you know, the condition of the oil and stuff and you didn't have to change it, but I'm not going to let a truck sit for, you know, two years and not do an oil change on it or anything like that. So it's um, the most nineties color as well. Mm-hmm. I don't know about yeah. the most nineties color. Dude, I think teal? like that, like that bright blue with like pink lines might take the cake there. I feel like that's oh, cool. like with the the crazy rad like graphics on the, the side of the it. radwood, yeah, like the splash, cup. yeah, splash, <laughs> the splash, Ford Ranger splash. A- there was a rain. I showed you the picture. I I parked <laughs> next to a Ranger splash up in New Hampshire, like a uh, an original one. It was terrible. Like an effing Ford Ranger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess you guys haven't seen that. Um, but yeah, some, some surf, a surf style windbreaker and some, uh, some Oakley's or now some pit vipers, and, <laughs> exactly. you know, a splash on the side, you'll fit right in. Uh-huh. Are, those the, are those the original wheels on it too? Oh, or you got to pull it up on Instagram looking at it. Yeah, I yeah. did. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the camp, the camper, the, the gramp camp on the back of it, it's for sale for 50 bucks. If you know anybody that wants one, but, um, <laughs> that thing, that thing's in great shape too, but yeah, that's stock wheels, everything stock on it. I mean, the running boards and probably just gonna leave it all in there. Cause I've got a seven year old and, um, makes it easy for him to climb in and out of there mm-hmm. and stuff. And the first time we drove it and put him, put my son catcher in the back. Um, my wife, 
you know, popped the passenger seat forward and she, she climbed up in it and, you know, turned around and, and just barely hunched over and was stand, almost like not quite standing in the truck, but yeah. there's just enough room back there that she could just kind of hunch over just barely <laughs> and buckle the seatbelt up and get him, get him situated. So perfect. Um, that works. Yeah. It's awesome. So are, are you going to wheel this thing? Cause I'm, I haven't looked at a stock height <sighs> truck like this in a long time and the rear overhang is crazy. There's so <laughs> much bed after the back tire. There is, but you know, see what I'm saying about the uh, departure angle on it and and the height of it. You know, I'm looking at my, I am. I'm looking at my Tacoma in the garage right now. Uh, Short bed, four door, 2020 Tacoma. Mm -hmm. You know, two and a half, uh, you know, inch lift on it, suspension package on it, and um, it it's not as high. The rear bumper is not as high as the Tundra is. Um, okay. It does have more over uh, does have more overhang, but I think when you put uh, you know put pen to paper and realize you know what angle you may be losing between the two of them, I think you'd be really shocked. Hmm. Um, you know, with maybe just like five five to seven degrees, you might be losing. You know, putting the truck side by side. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and look at the front. Yeah, look at the front of it too with the approach angle on it. So. Mm -hmm. no, but to answer your question, yeah, it's just silly. Um, but you know, to answer your question, um, uh, when I can get it away from my wife, maybe. But I've been instructed I'm not allowed to outfit this vehicle. So, <laughs> oh um, no, this is her pickup. This is her pickup. That's a good truck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's the the first time I brought the uh, I, I bought a, a 05 V8 Forerunner. And the, the first mm -hmm. time I, I got it home, it was to replace a, a Suburban. And we were going to have a Tacoma and a 4Runner because we only had three kids at the time. And then my wife was like, hey, let me try the 4Runner. I was like, okay. And I never <laughs> drove the 4Runner ever again. That almost <laughs> happened with your Sequoia, too. It did happen with the Sequoia. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did, you, a have a, did here. you have a first-gen Sequoia? Did you have uh, a first-gen Sequoia? It's a second-gen. It's an 08 um okay and so we, we had the 08 sequoia and then we just got a because we have four kids now we have a 2017 suburban and so once we got the suburban i, I basically i gave her a week or i didn't i to be honest i didn't put a time limit on it uh she limited herself to a week as she switched on and off every other day and then she was like nope sequoia it's like okay <laughs> okay <then. laughs> so yeah the, the i you know i you know the first gen Sequoias, I it's still such a good looking truck, man. I, um, you know, every once in a while you'll see somebody that's kind of done some work to one on, you know, just kind of a modest build or something. But, uh, you know, I, I still see those rolling down the road. And I'm like, oh, maybe I should trade this T100 in and try to find <laughs> one of those low miles on it. Well, and you know uh, what it, it is? Kind of defeats the purpose. Is it you don't pay the Land Cruiser tax on a Sequoia? Or, Oh. If you're going full size SUV of that era, you don't pay excursion tax, which is multiply Ooh, Sequoia yeah. price by like five. Yeah, but it's the same mm -hmm. four seven V eight as the Forerunners. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if if you can find a low mile one of those, you mm -hmm. yep. good trucks starting oh, yeah. to pop up. Starting All to see them getting it. built up, like you said, quite a bit just because they're cheap and, and I think their tow rating was high. It was like seven. So is that a torsion front? Two hundred. Mm, is I that don't... a tor So that's the only. That's the only thing unique about this T one hundred is it's a torsion, you know, front suspension, not a coilover. I don't remember. It's six sixty five hundred pounds is the tow rating on it. Oh, I thought it would be a little oh, more. Wow. But, well, because the yeah. Sequoia is like the second gen. The second one. I, I just said Sequoias, and we're talking about Sequoias. I can't talk tonight. Good lord. Um, <laughs> the, 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 like it's a, and it's only a two-year difference between like the first gen oh my god oh man second gen goes 7500 to 10,000 pounds like it's mm. oh wow yeah but then you can get the five seven versus the four seven so it's just anyway anyway completely derailed yeah off the rails <laughs> so, so jason what else is in your garage other than the t100 and the uh, tacoma 
Uh, we've got a, a 2015 Trail Forerunner that uh, we built. Um, uh, everything but you know uh, armor, you know front bumpers, uh, winch, and you know sliders and rear bumper and tire swing, all that stuff because we wanted to. It was my wife's, you know, it's been our family wagon for since we bought it new in 2015, and we wanted to build it to rent. Um, you know, thinking that it would really take off and it didn't, it hasn't done so well, just I think it's probably most, most of it's because of the geographic area we live in, you know, there's not a huge, and I think that's on the agenda to talk about. There's just not a lot of people coming to West Virginia, um, one, and then the area that we live in is, although it's a great mountain town where a lot of people like to come, you know, it's just getting people like connecting the dots between, I can fly in an airport and pick this thing up in five miles from the airport or have it waiting for me and I can take off and go explore but um so that's we've got the 2015 we've got the 2020 Tacoma with the camper on it got the T100 and then I've got a I've got a 13 and a half foot uh, raft on a trailer here sitting that we nice. spend a lot of time on in the summertime Fair so, pretty yeah. sure you yeah. had Fair a picture rounded. with both there's a picture with the forerunner and the and the raft. I had to scroll. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it's on there. Yeah, totally on there. Um, Is that and, a Triton uh, ATV trailer that you got it perched on? It's oh gosh, you want to talk about another good deal? So those those trailers, <laughs> snowmobile trailers. This is actually a the ATV Triton, right? I mean, it's yeah. basically a, it's essentially a snowmobile trailer. Yeah, um, just close them for just over top trailer. of yeah yeah for a raft. We put a uh, a roller on the back of it. Um, I actually put a hitch on the back of it too, so I could put a bike rack on it. Nice. Um, so when we can, you know, last, I think it was 2019, we hooked up to the, to my 2017 to come with a camper in the back of it, pulled the raft on the trailer, had, you know, three bikes off the back of the raft trailer driving, you know, around Tennessee and, you know, Northern Georgia, um, you know, for a week as a family trip. And we just, you know, float the rivers and, go biking and then sleep in the camper so um yeah it's a triton atv trailer and it's kind of a it's a kind of a coveted you know thing for for rafting i mean you can outfit regular utility trailers but again it was just kind of one of those things that just kind of happened upon i was looking and i found it on facebook marketplace um you know picked this thing up for i think it was 650 bucks oh my god and uh yeah, it's not a cheap. Well, trailer. if you find another one that's that cheap, holler. Just like, come pick it up in a heartbeat. <laughs> Holy shit! Oh, I could just I could drive it up there and turn it over in no time. I'm sure, you know, make quite a bit of profit off of it. But I uh, sold one of those for like seventeen hundred bucks, like ten years ago. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, guy yeah, put a new. Uh, I, th- I think actually just one sheet of plywood on there. I think you know two sheets of the original mm-hmm. plywood are on it. Um, but it's in great shape. Um, really rides well. Again, it's a torsion, two torsion axles on it. But uh, uh, yeah, we spent a lot of time on that raft and uh, towing it around during the summertime because you know we're fortunate enough to have a good a good uh, river here, the New River in West Virginia that you know accommodates large boats. And I tell you, we did a a raft trip. Uh, my son and I and a few friends did a raft trip. We had like six rafts going down the river a few weeks ago. And, uh, um, you know, I, with all the gear, I feel like I got in my garage, you know, you go, you go with, it's just kind of like going overlanding with somebody that does it a bunch and they've got everything kind of dialed in, you know, you go with these rafters and they've got, you know, these extravagant raft frames with these, you know, you know, aluminum dry boxes and, you know certain way the ways that they pack it and they can be packed up and ready to go in 30 seconds and you know i'm stuffing dry bags and trying to strap <laughs> stuff down it's taking me forever um but it oh, was uh, kind of fun to see people get that into it this is going to be a really dumb question but when you you put the raft on the river and mm-hmm. the river is flowing how do you then get back to your truck you paddle <laughs> upstream you paddle upstream that sounds terrible <laughs> Do you I really? don't envy that. No, I don't envy that. I'm so totally busting. Oh, no. oh, you believe me? Oh. Dude, well, great. I don't know um, shit about this stuff. Neither do I. <laughs> I've been on I'm a boat like, wow, like ten man. times in my life. Uh, that's got to be. That's got to be a workout. There has um, to be a surf. No, we, 
we it's have one uh, really strong so on board. <laughs> yeah. So the shuttle that we do for a typical, you know, eight hour float, for example, um, on the new river, um, which a lot of it is driving in and out of the gorge on either side, a typical out there and back and drop a car off is about an hour and 15 minutes or so. Um, so you either, you know, you go with a group of people and everybody kind of piles in and leaves one car at the end. Um, and then you just stack rafts on trailers or you take advantage of a shuttle service or somebody maybe that you know that lives there in that area. Um, and fortunately there's a couple people on the new river that, you know, have a shuttle service and you basically, you leave the keys on the vehicle in a certain spot and leave 60 bucks up, up above the visor. And, you know, you get off the river and your truck's there waiting for you. You don't have to worry about it. Sweet. Um, a lot of faith there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell it's you, it's a lot of stories. We've faith in the woods, you know, we've right? Had some stories with that. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, and then you're thinking like, Oh, you know, I'll have these thoughts occasionally floating down the river, river drinking a beer. And I'm like, I wonder if he's insured. Like, how does that work if you like totaled my truck? <laughs> right. <laughs> like in Florida, uh, it's still your truck. It's still your insurance. So I don't know how that works in West Virginia, absolutely. but. Yep. Um, but I'm sure it would be the same way. Uh, but, you know, we've, there's been, when we first started using this guy and he's, he's an old timer there on the new river, owned a couple raft companies before the big raft companies came in and bought, you know, the little guys out and stuff and then did fishing trips and stuff like that. But, uh, We've, we've been left on the side of the river, you know, at seven o'clock at night, three times, um, huh. you know, when we first started using him, but it got to the point that I you know, just had a long talk with him on the phone. And I said, you know, we, we depend on your service, but I can't, I can't leave my, you know, seven year old and my wife with a spork on the side of the river waiting for me to hitchhike and hopefully come back, <laughs> you know, so yeah. um, he's, he's never left us since in two years. Okay. So, um, but yeah. It's so start, I basically, I carry, I, yeah, it is. I carry an in-reach with me now every time yeah. I go down the river. So uh, I have to, you know, communicate or, you know, and I've, I've, I've gotten to know some people that live in that area where we paddle. So, you know, worst case we can get somebody down there to help us out. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you explained it like that. Cause we, so when we were in Montana, we'd cross, Oh God, I don't I, the river name's not coming to my mind tonight. I'm just struggling. Uh, but we, we cross this bridge headed to Glacier every morning. And every morning I'd count the same three cars in the same three spots. And I was like, I have no clue how they get back here. Cause the, the water was flowing fairly fast. So I'm glad you explained all that. Cause that was, that was literally on my list of questions to be like, how the hell do you get back? Like, <laughs> No, no, it's good. I mean, and honestly, like understanding how that works, it's kind of like the whole electric car market, right? So, you know, people, uh, what's the term that they have for it that's kind of circulating around in the news? It's a, a fear and anxiety. Right. Not range anxiety. Range anxiety. Vehicle. Range anxiety. That's what it is. So it's, it's kind of the fear of, you know, the, you know, the, the lack of education and understanding about it is, is scaring people away from even being interested in it. So, you know, once you, once you understand it, just like overlanding or camping or sports or whatever, once you understand how it works and get some, you know, industry insight or something like that, then, then it's approachable at that point. And, um, you know, so yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, that's, that was a big deciding factor on us. You know, we knew we, we, when we moved here to Lewisburg, we knew we wanted a raft. I'd wanted one, you know, since I was in high school. But uh, I, I, as much as I wanted one, I had to figure a solution out to be able to, because we're not going to drive, you know, two vehicles that gets, you know, 10 to 13 miles per gallon, <laughs> you know, down the road, 45 minutes, run another shuttle and then run another shuttle and then come home. You right. know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So, um you know, once you understand how all that works and what's available to you in your area, it, it makes it much more approachable. Is is river camping the quietest type of camping you've been around? Oh, uh, no, camping in New Brunswick was the quietest camping I've ever been New around. Brunswick. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, we've camped a lot of places in in our trucks and we you know backpacked forever i was in scouts when i was a kid that's kind of what got me into the outdoors and um you know i 
I mean, in the New River Gorge, no way, because there's a train, there's a railroad that runs through the okay. whole gorge. So um, it's it's peaceful. Um, you know, places like Spruce Knob, West Virginia, up in the high high region, um, the highlands of West Virginia. There um, is is the most peaceful camping um, that I've ever done outside of New Brunswick. New Brunswick, backcountry, coastline. Um, you know, northern New Brunswick, you know, out in, you know, the urban um, timber, timberlands and stuff like that. I mean, that that's just absurd. Um, you know, up there, it's just just unbelievable. Just by yourself. So, um, no, with the guys, you know, when we do, we did a series up in, uh, we called it Adventure Canada. It was about four years, maybe five years in the mountain state over when we went up there and you know, we, when we started Mountain State Overland, the, the goal was to um, to travel, you know, the Appalachian Range, whether yeah. we did it exactly from south to north or we did it hodgepodge here wherever we could, whenever we could find time off. You know, New, Br- New Brunswick is the terminus of the Appalachian Mountains, and it actually mm-hmm. goes into the water mm-hmm. north of New Brunswick and then comes out, you know, on some islands above, you know, north of New Brunswick, which we're not going to ferry out there just to park our truck and say we we landed on it but um (laughs) but uh so new brunswick was always kind of like that you know the bucket list for that for that uh you know that mission of you know mountain state overland so um the top end and you know because we've done we've done every state in the appalachian mountains um you know georgia all the way down into georgia and all the way up into maine new brunswick you know um and even in the green mountains and you know, the whites and, um, you know, so yeah, it's, it's been, there's a lot of stuff on the East coast, you know, I mean, we <laughs> see so much out West and Moab and, um, you know, Utah and all those areas are amazingly beautiful to travel in, but, you know, the East coast is really approachable for a whole lot of people. Um, and, uh, like I said, with rafting and how do you get up, to, how do you get back to your car? It's just like no one, knowing where to go and how to get there once you figure that out then you, it's all approachable that's my so how no you go, Chris, go ahead no no, no, no. Yeah, Mine, to... mine's too personal you go okay i was gonna ask how you guys plan trips you said you know this one was like a you knew you had to do it at some point so you just picked it apart and did it piece by piece and you mentioned that earlier hmm. about the i think what you said transcontinental transamerican Trans- um yeah trans america trail yeah so how, like what's your baseline for coming up with adventures is it just somebody throws an idea out there and everybody gets on board or is it like a, um, a group meeting it's pretty informal you know i mean it's uh just as fun as this talk is right now you know you just um we i'm usually the catalyst or the <laughs> the, the planner of the of the group and you know, the guys share the responsibility of, of filming and then I do all the post-production stuff, but I, you know, I'm the producer and it's all, I'll, I'll figure out what adventures we need to tackle. And, you know, we do guided trips in West Virginia now, but we, you know, since we started Mount State Overland eight years ago, it was always about, um, what are we going to do? You know, where, where are we going to go? So for the first six years of Mountain State Overland, it was, dedicated to traveling in the Appalachian Mountains. So once I could get everybody's schedules figured out and we could all agree on, you know, 10 days or seven days that we could get away from home, you know, I'd say, okay, well, we've done this section. Let's go do this section. And I'd just spend, you know, hours on Google Maps at the time before all these apps came out, you know, kind of can drop you in places with that with a little effort. We spent a lot of time on Google Maps and Google Aerial just finding windy roads that look like they may be gravel from, from an aerial, you know, satellite view and um, started, we'd pick a point A and point B and try to find the most roundabout way to get from point A to point B. And then we'd just, you know, ninja camp along the way, which is just dispersed camp wherever we could. And um, it just made for some really <laughs> fun adventures. And, um, you know, when we land at camp and we're sitting there, or we get close to the end of our seven to 10 days or two weeks that sometimes, you know, we're already talking about what do we do next? You know, what do we do next? And after we yeah. kind of tackled most of the Appalachian mountains um, and there's still a lot of stuff out there, 
um, we actually we were out west uh, over the Expo West, and um, and we were like, let's do the Trans America Trail. You know, I mean, I started off, you know, adventure motorcycling and filming myself like way back, and um, okay. so I was kind of kind of plugged into the, the ADV market, and um, you know, all the trail opportunities that were out there for that, and that's when you know, um, people started working together to kind of put this, this, you know, continental route together. And, um, and so we were out West kind of talking, like, what do we do next? And we're done with the Appalachian mountains. And you know, everybody's like, we got to do the trans America trail. And they're talking about, you know, taking 30 to 40 days off work. And I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> I, you know, I got <laughs> Yeah. Very, very few time, people I, can. Yeah. You, I can't, I can't do that. And, you know, 95 percent of probably more than that it's probably like 98 percent of people that are into you know overland or adventure camping and stuff like that or or dual sport riders you know they they can't mm -hmm. and uh they so how do you break that down for people watching a youtube show um and 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 make it you know reachable for them to do it, it, it just do it yourself you know, and say, well, let's just go as far as we can go in two weekends in a week. And we're going to hammer down and we're going to move as quickly and safely as possible and uh, and try to get to where we wanted to go. And the first year we did the Trans America Trail, which was last year, we started in uh, southern Virginia and our goal was the Ozarks. And we made it to like central tennessee <laughs> so, you know because it was just like, you know when you're when you, yeah you, I was you know, we were really stomach. yeah yeah you know and i and i you're playing ahead a little bit in case you do get that far so you got a place to go but it was like something that just really pushed us and then it started kind of setting in like wow you know we we've got something planned <laughs> for this for these four or five whatever six guys that you know, end up making it all the way across the country. We've got, we've got a plan for like the next seven years of content, you know I mean? Mm -hmm. And we're not, we're not pushing out YouTube videos every week. You know, we've got day jobs and um, you know, stuff like that, but that having those conversations like we are right now or around a campfire or you're in the element and you're getting really connected with, you know, being a professional dirt bag, um, you know, you want to be, you want to live that lifestyle. And so you're just trying to find opportunities and the Trans America Trail is a great one for that. I mean, it's, it's obviously designed around, you know, motorcyclists because there's a lot of windy roads um, that some are paved and some are not. And some days we'll have all dirt days and then some days we'll have all paved days, you know, but the further, you know, we get West, um, you know, the more dirt and more technical terrain there'll be. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I've, I've felt like while you've been talking, I've been putting images of a Trans America Trail. Like the people that have put it, like their chunks in there, like I'm doing this half, fifteen hundred miles. They, they didn't say how long it's going to take them, but it's like the <laughs> they, they picked Colorado West. I was like, good luck. <laughs> well, and that's the, the thing. When we first started it, we were like, we got to stay on it the whole time, and we got to give people the real experience about being on it. That halfway through last year when we did the section that we did, we started realizing that we're really missing a lot of good story content and we're, we're really missing a lot of, you know, fun things to do along the way. So, yeah. you know, halfway through this, this last trip that we did film and we, we came to the conclusion that we're going to use the trans America trail as our, as our through way to go to really cool places, meet really cool people and get back to storytelling um so that we can really have a more a, a, you know much more enjoyable experience you know because when you when you get in this kind of you know youtube creator world you you know you you can push yourself really hard and stress yourself out a lot and really not focus on the, the core reason why you're doing what you're doing and uh, so slowing mm -hmm. it down a little bit um you know, spending two days like we did in the Ozarks, we, we motored across Mississippi, the last part of Tennessee, um, and then hit Arkansas. And then we wanted to get to our, the Ozarks as quick as we could, because for years, you know, I've been, you know, on podcasts or, you know, on videos with people that, you know, were doing some overlanding in the Ozarks. And I was like, that looks like a lot of fun, you know, and there's a lot of really good trails and 
Um, you know, it's a very welcoming place for the side by side, you know, motorsport world mm -hmm. and, you know, for four wheel drives. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. So we wanted to spend some time there instead of spending two days trying to reach Oklahoma. We wanted to get to those arcs and spend two days off of the trans America trail, uh, really, really experiencing it. So, you know, we could feel like we were there and actually did something instead of just drove through it. I, yeah. I freaking love it. I love all yeah. of this. <laughs> all about it. I know it's so good. It's so good. But no, you make such a good point. It like, the reason that we're in this stuff, you know, is if you make a little money on the side or like get enjoyment out of making the YouTube videos, great. And sharing the story with everybody else is great. But ultimately you got to like enjoy the moment on the trail and doing the thing that you spend all the time, not on the trail, thinking about it, you know, like mm -hmm. when you're home planning for whatever it is, like you, you don't want to let those moments when you're actually there like slip by and it's super easy to do that even if you're just taking pictures you know like trying to document oh yeah stuff. but yeah you know the fun thing slippery, about slippery, the fun slow. thing about yeah it is you know and the fun thing about document and taking pictures is you're you know you're really tr you're really trying to seek out the beauty of the experience because mm -hmm. you know you're um whether you're a professional photographer or not, you know, I mean, you're, you're looking for, you know, to capture that moment that really says, wow, I can look back at that and not just have a memory, but like, or my son can look back at that when he's a teenager and gets his first pickup yeah. and takes a senior trip from high school with his buddies on a week long adventure, travel and dad's routes, you know, like mm -hmm. he can look at that and say, wow, this place looks really amazing. I want to go there, you know, um, which, you know, that's a slippery slope too with, you know, geotagging locations, which is the whole, you know, big problem too. But it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's getting people out to, you know, getting people outside and yeah. uh, realizing what their surroundings, what's in their surroundings. 100%. So... so how how often and like I, I I don't have a rooftop tent. I just have a ground mm -hmm. tent. I feel like what you were describing before with like guys in their rafts who could throw it together in 30 seconds. I feel like that's me in the morning trying to get everything put put away where everyone else is like slamming rooftop tents down and they're gone. I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> Is anybody watching me? How am I taking too long to put everything away? <laughs> and you're like stressed out because you're like, oh, sorry guys, I'm sorry. Yeah. I think it's a lot of dirty. Yeah. Because already on the river floating downstream and you're trying to paddle to keep up with them or I you know, start drive first your truck and, and I'm yep. finished last. And last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, story of my life. <laughs> so do you have a heater so, in the camper on the back of the Tacoma? Yeah, I do. I do. I've got a heater and two fridges in there and I've got a, I've got a, I'm going to put another fan in after the time we spent in Arkansas. It was just big. That was one of the poor planning, most poorly planned, like, uh, you know, on my part of any of the trips that I feel like we've probably done in the last eight years was to go to Mississippi and Arkansas in August. Um, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Fortunately, oh. fortunately, we planned, you know, to be, I, I had thought, you know, ahead, you know, it just, it worked out the best for most of our schedules to do it until there were horse flies and fire ants. And I mean, it probably didn't rain all summer long until we decided to go on this trip and it was just rainy, humid, rainy, humid, rainy, humid, 95 degrees, you know, so, um, but so I'll probably put another fan in there, you know, and we've got, we've, we've, you know, the more you do this type of stuff, the more you, you know, get dialed in and I want to make it a little more comfortable or, you know, I'm going to purpose this vehicle as opposed to just going out and buying all this stuff just to have it and really never use it. Um, if you it know, I wanted to hit on used, what you talked Yeah. It, right. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a, you know, the Overland, you know, industry is, is a money suck for, you know, people that, you know, they see these images, they watch these videos, they just feel like they got to have all that. And, you know, to hit what you were, <laughs> or the path you were going, with the path that you were going down is like, you know, how, how do you, 
how is it how you know what is it like to be the guy that doesn't really or the or the girl or the lady or the man or whatever like you know how does it feel to be that person that is going to take longer to do it well we do we started doing guided trips about four years ago in west virginia and um because it was a business model one and two we really wanted to connect with the people that watched our show and we couldn't do it on these like team trips where we're just like you know filming like mad and just you know busting down gravel roads at 30 miles an hour um because it just wasn't safe for somebody that's just getting started <laughs> no, but no. uh no. And I do not condone speeding, um, um, just to get that out there. But anyway, so, um, you know, so having this kind of like, whether you're, you know, a professional rock crawler getting into camping or you're a camper getting into driving a four wheel drive vehicle, like just offering, you know, a service in a very small capacity with a very, you know, you know, small group of people that you can, you know, talk to and you can share experiences with and you know trying to create that opportunity was was something that we really wanted to do and so you get people you know on these trips that you know we've done trips where everybody had you know a ground tent or a gazelle tent or you know something or they slept in hammocks or whatever i mean you know um and and there's nothing wrong with that at all i mean that's what i started doing when i started car camping in high school you know so and it takes it takes them a little bit longer. I just sleep in now, and I let them get packed up, and then when they're ready to go, I'll wake up and close nice. my tent, and I'm ready. <laughs> nice. Yeah. That that literally the so, last the last trip we took in the in the spring where I went with the the other guys that I've generally gone out with. That's a hundred percent. Like I was up first. I got my sunrise shots because I was up first, and then made mm-hmm. breakfast and started packing up first, and everybody else kind of rolled out of their vehicles as I was finishing. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah i got pack some good old bars and grab a glass of milk and hit the road you know i mean I, um but you know we the good thing about those trips those guided trips is like these people who are like contemplating getting into it or these people that are very seasoned that just want to be with people to do it you know just focusing on those people that you know are just getting started this is like it's a great opportunity for those people to see all of these products and touch all of these products and things that you know, they feel like they have to have, but they don't have, but they can make very calculated decisions about what's the next thing I need to do for my truck. Yeah. You know, do I need 20 off road lights that I can't use because it's not legal or do I need <laughs> right. an awning that I can hide <laughs> under when it's raining, you know? So, um, you know, the, it's a, it's a great tool for that. And it makes it, like I said, with rafting and everything else, it makes it, you know, once they learn and understand, it makes it, it it's more approachable and they're going to want to do it more. Makes sense. So did you guys have a ridge line on a recent trip? We did. We did. And he, he actually, um, Ian was his name. He's a really, really cool guy. And he brought his sister and his daughter. I think she was three years old. Um, but he had a ridge line. It was the new, the new ridge line. So the, they finally got the, I feel like they finally dialed in the body lines. Um, yep. <laughs> you know, I think the, I think the first gen ridge line, if they just would have stick with a pickup type bed, I think it would have been a huge seller. Um, mm-hmm. And then they couldn't figure out if they wanted a, an accord with a truck, up, a truck bed or a minivan with a truck bed. And then they yeah, came out CRV. with a, yeah, <laughs> CRV, right. You know, but then they came out with a new, uh, the new lines and it's just it's a good looking truck and uh so he has he has a company that where he actually um fabricates skid plates um you know suspension packages and things like that to uh you know make make the vehicle even more capable off-road um we did we did knock a yeah you know and it's a very capable truck i mean the traction control system is very good i mean he it was kind of fun to talk to somebody that's really into the ridge line and knows it very well. Um, you know, the, you know, the transmission can get hot, you know, and things like that. So he's got, you know, you know, clusters where he's monitoring the performance of the vehicle. And then, uh, you know, we just lightly wheeled it for a weekend camping and you know, knocked the uh, passenger rear tire out of alignment. 
So we had to pull over. It was really bad. Too. Oh. We had to pull over, jack it up, and uh, you know, get it quasi aligned so he could enjoy the last night camping before finding a service station to get the line to drive back home. But um, I think you know it's it's very capable. I, I mean, I don't think it's quite nearly as rugged as you know some of the other options out there. Um, but for just gravel pounding and getting out to cool campsites, a hundred percent all the way. You know, it's a yep. great vehicle. Yeah, they're good trucks. I spent, I had one for a week as a press loaner earlier this summer. It was great. Mm -hmm. I freaking loved it. I drove it. Oh you know, yeah, like five hundred miles, and it was it was killer. And we had Dan Edmonds on the show, and he said when this generation of Ridgeline came out, they put it against the Tacoma against the, on the washboards out west, and the stock Tacoma's shocks were leaking by like, I don't know, what do you say, halfway to uh, where they were headed or something? I feel like it was 27 miles, and I thought he said it was like within the first five that the Tacoma and the Frontier? Was it a front? I can't remember if it was a Frontier, frontier or, or Titan. Titan. It was Titan. Yeah. It wasn't a Frontier, but the ridge line just didn't care because it's you know light and independent what, suspension was it a trd pro with the fox suspension or was it no, the no, no, with no. The i think this stock? might have been before the trd pro had fox this was probably in like mm -hmm. 20 i'm gonna get it wrong 16 i'm gonna 17, get you the date here in a second 15 i don't know 20 it was, it was 2017 2017 but July. it was a t it was just a TRD off road, so like the where they like oh, just Bill Stein shop, Bill it, yeah. yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. 2016 Tacoma TRD off road, 2016 Titan XD Pro 4X versus so, 6,800 pounds of Titan <laughs> versus the 2017 yeah. Honda Ridgeline. But like, there's no Honda didn't give it any. It wasn't the HPD. It was like there's no cool name for well, the HPD is stupid and doesn't do anything anyways. So. We've established that. <laughs> what, what What is the, uh, so have you guys spent any time in the new frontier yet? Funny you should say that. I uh, just had correspondence with Nissan to drive it for a week or two this fall. So awesome. haven't been in it. Everybody that's been in it said it was killer. Tell them you want to take it down to West Virginia and go for a ride with Mountain State Air. Oh, yeah. we'll put it to the test. Yeah. I'm supposed to go yeah. down to Tennessee the week of October 11th. So if we time it right, maybe we'll do mm -hmm. something. Yeah, absolutely. And hey guys, I'm going to put uh, 1,500 miles on your frontier. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if they yeah. get exposure, they won't care. No, I, I mm -mm. promise you, they they will. <laughs> <laughs> they will that much over. But if it comes with an estimate or a limit, then yeah, I'm sure. Okay. Hence the catch. They stink then. <laughs> Anyways, all right, I got to wrap things up. You're about to be a pumpkin. Uh, turn it into a pumpkin. Yep. Jason, do you <laughs> want to plug anything? Do you have series coming up? We do. So we just got back from um, our second leg of the Trans America Trail from Williamsport, Tennessee, there at uh, Fisher's Off Road to the Ozarks in Arkansas um 10 day adventure will be releasing in a film series on youtube um just google mountain state overland you'll get all of everything anywhere on social media um, that we do you can search west virginia overland and find us there too pretty easily um but that show is going to be coming out uh and all of our videos actually will be coming out um this late fall you know into the winter months uh when people aren't getting out and they want something to watch that's when we're going to be putting stuff out there so yeah it's a good time you know we're focused on really focused on you know uh you know living the adventure lifestyle um out of these trucks and and telling stories along the way and, and interviewing people and you know making stops so that you know a trip like this is appealing for everybody instead of just sitting your butt in your driver's seat and driving all day long you know um so yeah that, that'll be coming out with all of our videos um here late fall this winter um mountainstateoverland.com you can find us on instagram at ms overland um and all of the social channels 
at MS Overland as well. So guys, I really appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun talking <laughs> to you. Yeah, man. Happy to have you on. I'm, I'm going to pick yeah. you for one more thing, Ross. You can go to bed if you need to. You're good. The overkill <laughs> camper, Jason. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. So I'll try to keep it short. Um, <laughs> so you, you, you wanted to talk about, so we had an Opus on a trip yep. that somebody pulled. I've watched uh, what used to be four wheel drive action is now four wheel drive 24 um, seven. Graham and Sean there in uh, mm-hmm. Australia put on a really good show. I just love watching them. It's a lot of fun. They're high energy. Um, <laughs> they, you know, they've had Opus tra- trailers there too. Um, but we had one on on a trip with us and we pulled a trailer. You know, I've never been a fan of pulling uh, any sort of anything behind a four wheel drive vehicle. I did it once uh, about two years into Mountain State Overland. I pulled a, uh, I think it, I think the, the wet weight um, on it when the tank was filled up was like 3,500 pounds. Okay. And I, and uh, I couldn't move anywhere. I mean, I'd stop on gravel with a slight incline and I had to put in four wheel drive to get going oh. partially due to driving a midsize pickup um, partially due to maybe a little bit too high air pressure because we were kind of green when we first started doing this. Um, but either way, it was just like, after that, I was just like, never again, just not going to do it. Um, we had an opportunity on this trip to, you know, put our, our photographer um, with us instead of him driving his own vehicle. So um, good friends with the guys in North Carolina road rentals and uh, they rent out camper trailers and uh, overkill um, has a small, I think they call it the TK 47 all inclusive camper trailer that you, with, with sleeping quarters. So, you know, you don't have, this big gigantic, you know, utility box on a, on, on an axle that you're pulling with a rooftop tent on top of it, you've got an all enclosed space. Um, we How actually did have a rooftop tent. On. Well, that's what I was, that's my point. I, I, you know, I, I, I looked at it and before I kind of hunted down Rove Reynolds and started talking to him, you know, um, I was, tar- I was targeting my toe to not exceed um, a thousand pounds. And I knew, you know, a thousand pounds dry weight. I think that, that was what I was looking at. I was looking maybe to pull like a X venture, a shot industries, um, XV three, which is like dry weight on that. I think is like 850 pounds. Oh you know, you put 150 pound tin on it, you know, you're right in the money, you know, cause I knew, I knew after pulling that big trailer we did when we first started doing this, that the weight is the big, the big piece of it. And, mm-hmm. um, so I wanted something, you know, nimble, and I found out they got this Overkill TK47, and I started looking at the specs on it, and I was like, oh my gosh, this thing's like right at a thousand pounds. It's like perfect, you know. It's got a water tank. It's got all this stuff, you know, that um, that you know, charging capabilities, solar on the roof, you know, it had all these things down in. It was going to be a good sleeping quarters for our photog. You got to take care of that guy, and um, <laughs> so he's not. He's definitely not a high maintenance guy, but he's busting his butt all day long running and gunning with the camera. So we wanted to make sure he had good sleeping quarters. We'd take care of him. And uh, we didn't have to worry about folding the tent open. When we got to camp, um, he just opened the side wing door on it and, you know, um, let his dirty clothes air out. And, uh, and then he'd go to bed and he'd had a fan in there and everything. So it's just, it was a great experience pulling that trailer. Um, I think this is their first, uh, their their first model of the TK forty seven. Um, there there's there's some some little things that I think they need to work out. Um, I think they could probably reduce the amount of access doors and hinges and gaskets, you know, by just having one cabinet door. Um, you know, the more the the less less room for water intrusion, the best at the end of the day, the longer yeah, the trailer is yeah. going to last. Uh, didn't have springs and shocks. It was all on uh, Timberin, um, you know, bump stops. Um, okay. It tracked it tracked very well. Um, you know, it could have been on a like a load range C tire. I don't think it needed heavy, you know, load range E tires on it because you couldn't really, if you take the air pressure out of the tires, it, it's just not enough weight on those big tires to to squat it down. But you know, once you get the tire pressure around 25 psi, it rides like a. It just you don't even know it's back there. I mean, on a, on a Tacoma, you just didn't even know it's back there. Um, 
Well, no. So it was great. It was, uh, you know, like I said, there's some things that need to be worked out, you know, with doors and gaskets and things like that, but all easy stuff to figure out. I mean, they're engineers, they'll, they'll have another one hacked out, I'm sure in the next year, but, um, <laughs> the open, the, the opus is, uh, is a, is pretty awesome, but you know, I was looking a little bit before we got on the call they have a, an Opus uh, OP light, I think yes. is their kind of two and a half sleeper. Yeah. Um, that thing is like 2,300 pounds. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't even look at the, you know, I, I just, I go and I look at the weight first. Cause I'm exactly. not driving a full size truck. <laughs> I don't care how long it is, how high off the ground it is or anything. I'm just going to look at the weight first. And if mm-hmm. I, if I, if it's not around that thousand pound mark, I'm just not even going to entertain it. And I think that's the huge, that's going to be the huge selling point for overkill is that I think they got that dialed in because they realize there's so many people traveling in mid-sized vehicles um, right now that really kind of want to get off the beaten path, mm-hmm. um, you know, and not, not have a base camp trailer, but actually have a trailer you can pull with you everywhere you need to go. And, and we put this trailer through the ringer, you know, in the mud, crossing creeks, crossing rivers, some technical, for, some, some very technical rock crawling type four wheel drive stuff, you know, mild bouldering, but nothing serious, you know, um, you know, and, and the Opus is, is a machine. I mean, it's got a great suspension system, you know, if you have a vehicle powerful enough to tow it anywhere, you know, you can do what Graham and, you know, Sean and those people, those guys, the Opus guys, they take with them on some they of their adventures. They thrash and you can those things dr- too, though. They thrash them yeah absolutely but that one they're pulling you know it's right around the three thousand pound range so it's just kind of like um but the, the couple that had it um <laughs> they, that they, they, lo- <laughs> they they loved it they they absolutely loved their opus um we did a walk around with them we'll have a video of that coming out this winter um they love it. It's awesome. It, you know, the best way to describe it once it's inflated and once it's fully kind of folded out, it's like sitting in a luxury pontoon boat. Okay. You know, the ones that you'll yeah, see, yeah. The, the real, really fancy pontoon boats that you see out on the water with the really plush seats and like all of the amenities, not just like a, a party barge, you know, Bass Pro party barge, but like a real like legit pontoon boat. Sun like, tracker. That's how it felt. Yeah, like a, <laughs> like a really nice sun tracker, and uh, it was just it's fantastic, and uh, they keep it really clean and take really good care of it. And it, it's you know there's a compressor on it that'll actually deflate and inflate it. Um, so yeah, I mean I um, it, to each their own. You know if, if you're gonna if you're gonna really you know get out there and want something lightweight that's not gonna hamper your experience, and you got a midsize truck, look for something you know, in that upper, you know, hundred to upper hundreds to, you know, lower thousand pound range. If you've got, you know, base camp in mind where you're going to drop a trailer and, you know, go out and explore, then I don't think it really matters what you pull at that point. Yeah. This is, Um, I was discussing with a friend recently of like, they, they also have four kids. I was like, listen, if we both take trailers, when we go when we go out, if we end up at an RV park, like at least we know we have our crazy kids together. We don't have to worry about like who else they're gonna meet. Like uh-huh. they'll yeah, we'll, we'll just let the kids and then we can just drop the trailers and we can still have that hilariously, we both drive white suburbans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's uh uh I told them, I said, guys, we're going to put this thing through the ringer. And they said, okay, go do it. You know, we want to know if it's something that we want to continue to rent. And, uh, and you know, the, the price point, I looked at this before I you know, got on the call, the price point on the OP uh, light, I think starts at 18. I think the TK um, 47 starts at 17. Yeah. It's not bad. And it's, uh, uh, you know, about 1,300 pounds lighter. <laughs> weight is the enemy it is it is do you hear this do you hear this is this in the background somebody's got a turkey call or what no it's my wife watching something on her phone and she decided oh. <laughs> to send it to losing, me. Her, <laughs> losing her shit already <laughs> yeah so it's, sarah, it does sound like it's time to wrap up tell sarah she has to share with the class if it's that funny 
Oh, yeah. She All put right. it to my phone, so I'll send to you in a little bit, guys. <laughs> All right. <sounds> good. <laughs> <laughs> better be good so uh let's wrap all this up you can rate and review us on itunes you can like and subscribe to us on youtube you can like and subscribe to mountain state overland on youtube uh i did well i was i have constantly been browsing the videos there are tons of videos to watch from them um very good too very mountain state overland is ms overland on instagram twitter youtube facebook i think i've got them all you, you guys aren't on snapchat are you we tried. It didn't make any sense. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Snapchat rarely like, makes Wait. sense. I, like, I went through all like, this work and it disappears. Exactly. Like, what? Yeah. What? Exactly. Oh. My my favorite is people yeah. yelling at me like, "You guys got to do reels now." I'm like, "I think I'm too old." Uh, I thought about TikTok for like a brief second, and then uh, I said no. So no, yeah. no, thank you. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, you can read what Ross and I write at Hooniverse, uh, The Hooniverse on Twitter, The Real Hooniverse on Instagram, or you can read what we write at Hooniverse, UTV Driver, ATV Writer, and I have been so swamped, I haven't done anything else lately. So <laughs> Ross is at No Not Like The One From Friends, which for whatever reason, I've been getting friends reels constantly <laughs> lately. It's not from me. It's just clips of the show. I'm like, I feel like I've rewatched Friends again. I don't, I don't need to watch an episode ever again because I'm getting it on Instagram. I've still uh, seen it. So, and I'm, I'm at Overlanding Dad, and we've done it. That's the show. That's the show. Thanks, Jason, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it, man. Yeah, good time for sure.